Hey everybody, welcome back. My name is Annie Elise and this is Tend to Life where we talk everything true crime. So if you're brand new, you've never seen this channel, make sure that you subscribe, assuming you, you know, appreciate today's case coverage and like this channel because then you will get notified, maybe, about new videos. YouTube doesn't like to notify people, so it's, t it's like taking a chance. You can subscribe, you can turn on your notification bell, and maybe you'll get notified. Um, so make sure you do that if you like the channel. And for all of my returning 10 to lifers, welcome back. I'm happy to have you guys here today. We have got a lot to talk about. It is a case that is very complex, very sad, and one that so many of you guys have been talking about and asking for. And guys, just as you think you know this case and you know where it's going, you don't. There is a twist at the end, a couple twists, but one at the very end that nobody saw coming. So guys, let's jump right in. Sent to life with Annie Elise starts right now. It's safe to say that you can learn a lot of do's and don'ts while watching true crime. I think we can all agree on that. However, there are some things in life that you just don't see coming, no matter how prepared. Over the years, I've seen a lot of people who victim blame, who will say, you know, why didn't so-and-so scream? Or she should have just, you know, ninja kicked him and kicked him in the nuts and then booked him out of there. You know, it's so easy to say kind of ignorant things like this, but the fact is, it's just not that simple. I think we all try to pinpoint the moment in a victim's story where it goes from normal to deadly and think to ourselves, what could have been done to prevent this? So it's easy for us to just sit at home in a non-threatening situation and say, well, if this ever happened to me, here's what I would do. It's a fair question, but not a fair circumstance. We watch true crime knowing that most of the time the story ends in a tragic death. We start way ahead of the victims in these stories, though. And none of these victims knew what was going to happen to them the morning of or sometimes 10 minutes before their death. So, of course, hindsight is always 2020. Not very helpful, though, to a victim or a murderer, is it? There are some stories that don't have a clear timeline of events, and these cases stop short, leaving us all hanging for answers. Months and sometimes years down the road, even. We all remember the story of Tara Calico, the girl on the bike, back in 88, or a lot of us remember it if I'm aging myself here, or more recently, let me do it that way, Little Summer Wells, and the infamous TikTok of her with the milk jugs. It's like someone took these cases, ripped them apart, and threw the most important pieces out. We may have our theories, but we're still a long way from justice in a lot of these cases, if that even ever does come. And today's case is very similar to those other two that I just named. But also, Leah Croucher is also very unique in many ways. After years of red herrings, this mystery remained at a standstill. It left everyone wondering, how can you possibly just disappear without a trace? Over the Atlantic Ocean, or, you know, across the pond, so to speak, our story begin and ends in Buckinghamshire, England. Leah Croucher was born on August 14, 1999, to her parents John and Claire Croucher in Milton Keynes, the only city in Buckinghamshire. Leah had two half-siblings, her sister Jade and brother Hayden. Both were significantly older than Leah, by seven and five years, respectively. Leah was very close to everybody in her family, especially her big brother Hayden. Her father, John Croucher, was a practiced martial arts fan and taekwondo instructor. He, in turn, raised his son and youngest daughter to master the sport as they grew up. They were considered martial art experts and competed in several competitions over their teen years. It's safe to say that despite the substantial age gap, Hayden and Leah were extremely close in the bond that they shared over Taekwondo. This photo was from one of Leah's competitions when she was just 14 years old. Her brother Hayden had posted it to his Facebook and the two siblings playfully went back and forth in the comments, as you can see here. Hayden both teasing and praising Leah, who was his best match with her witty antics as well. Now you may want to pause to read, especially if you struggle with certain English accents. However, you don't need to know anything about Taekwondo to see the underlying love and pride that he has for his little sister. Now hang on to this sweet moment, because we don't get many in this story. As Leah grew into a young woman, at age 19, she was described by family as a bright, responsible, confident, witty, and funny teen. She loved fantasy fiction and enjoyed spending time at home. Leah cared a lot about her family and friends and was said to be a very family-oriented person, just all around a great young woman. 
On Valentine's Day of 2019, Leo walked to work at her job in a finance company called Debit Finance Collections PLC. She walked into work at 8 a.m. And when the workday was over, she left at about 5 p.m. and began walking home. At 5.45, the location settings on her phone were switched off around the Furtston Lake area. And Leah finally then returned home at 6 p.m. and tells her mother that she was going to visit some friends. Now look, we've all used that line once or twice, I'm sure. I know I have. Where I say, oh, I'm going out, I'm going to go visit some friends, you know, I'll be back soon. So she arrived home a little over an hour later at 7.15 p.m. And by all accounts, she had been acting totally normal. But at about 10 p.m. that Thursday night, Claire Croucher would lay eyes on her daughter for the very last time. The next morning on Friday, February 15th, Leah woke up early and got ready for work, as she always did. And at 8 a.m., she left her family home in Quantock Crescent Emerson Valley to walk her regular two-mile route on that cold winter morning. A pretty hefty walk, if you ask me. In the afternoon, her parents arrived home from work themselves. They worried, though, when their daughter wasn't home by 6 p.m. Leah was a creature of habit, and this was very out of character for her. So they called 999, which is the UK's version of 911, totally panicked and explained the situation. Luckily, the Thames Valley Police Department jumped on this case. They scoured CCTV footage of her on that morning route to work and almost immediately found footage of Leah walking in Furston on Buzzcott Lane around 8.15 a.m. and she was walking in the direction of Locksbear Drive and Shafron Way. There was a sighting at 8.20 of a young woman nearby, matching her description as well. And then around 8.34 a.m., Leah essentially fell off the grid. All of her cell phone activity went dead. No social media activity or any bank cards were used after her phone was shut off. Two unconfirmed sightings were reported of a young woman matching her description at 8.45 a.m. near Teardrop Lake, just 0.1 mile away from her job at that finance location. Due to the unconfirmed sightings, police sent divers into Teardrop Lakes. They searched the entire lake to no avail, but they didn't stop there. They canvassed all of the surrounding neighborhoods as well. They knocked on 4,000 doors and passed out flyers to each resident. There were two unconfirmed sightings of her by Teardrop Lake. Police are actively searching Teardrop Lake today after those two unconfirmed sightings of Leah here last Friday morning. They're searching the water, they're also searching the surrounding area, looking for any bits of information and evidence that could help them in this inquiry. Police have not only been using divers, but have also knocked on 4,000 doors in the area, gathering information. Since she was last seen, there's been no use of her mobile phone, she hasn't accessed her bank, and she hasn't used social media. This is really unusual for Leah. We'd encourage anybody who has seen Leah, who has spoken to Leah, uh, who knows people who have spoken or, or seen her, or anybody who's got any information whatsoever, then to come forward, no matter how small they think that might, bit of information might actually be. As police try to piece together Leah's movements last Friday, searches of the area continue. They're giving out leaflets in Milton Keynes this weekend in the hope of finding new leads in the investigation. When you pull up Google Maps, the most direct way to Leah's work is by taking Quantock Crescent to a small path leading to Fulmer Street, then about 0.9 miles from Fulmer Street to a roundabout leading to Shafron Way. Follow Shafron Way past Locksbear Drive all the way to Davie Avenue in No Hole where her office is located. The pink line is the alternate route that she chose. However, based on the CCTV footage of her being on Buzzacott Lane in Furston and later statements from the police department, she took a totally different route, up to five minutes longer during the commuting hours of the day. Instead of taking the main road, this is the route that she took the 13th and 14th of February. She stayed on a small path past Fulmer Street and took it to Buzzacott Lane. Now, if you look at the bottom of this picture, Leah turned on Buzzacott where the pink and blue line meet. The pink line indicates where she's coming from. The blue line indicates where she was captured by CCTV footage walking from 8.15 to 8.16 a.m. on that tiny strip of Buzzcott Lane the day that she went missing. So if we go by the two days prior, then she should have continued down and made a left on Dolverton Drive. Based on her taking longer routes to avoid the main roads, it's safe to assume that she would have cut over the Teletubby Hill path in the grassy area and made a right on Locksbear Drive. From there, though, it's a total mystery. Route 1, her usual route, where she would continue all the way down Locksbear Drive, 
and made a left onto a small path parallel to Locksbur Drive, she would have crossed Shafron Way via the small path, continued along Redwood Gate, and made a right on the path along Faraday. She would stay along Faraday on her way to work by making a right on Davy near Teardrop Lake, which is only 0.1 mile from the closest section of the lake to the finance office where she worked and where the unconfirmed sightings at 8.45 a.m. were. The only problem here is that Faraday Drive had CCTV cameras that picked her up every day except on the 15th. So what happened to her? Were those sightings by her work actually her? Had she taken a different route on the 15th? There were so many questions and none were being answered. My name is Neil Kentish. I'm the Deputy Commander for the Police in Milton Keynes. It's been two weeks since Leah Crouch went missing while walking to work. Leah was last seen in Buzzercott Lane in Furston, where she was captured on CCTV at about quarter past eight in the morning on Friday the 15th of February. I can confirm, two weeks on, we still have no further confirmed sightings of Leah since that time. Leah's usual route to work would be by Buzzcott Lane and then into Faraday Drive, using the redways to travel north to Kelvin Drive in Knoll Hill. We know that this is the route that Leah took to work on the 13th and the 14th of February. However, extensive CCTV work has shown us that she did not arrive in Faraday Drive on the morning she went missing. Our appeal today is to urge anybody in the area between Buscott Lane and Faraday Drive after quarter past eight in the morning on Friday the 15th of February or who has dash cam footage or CCTV from that day please come forward and speak to us. Today we are releasing new footage of Leah taken from the 14th of February. This shows her as she did most days walking to her place of work. We hope this will help jog somebody's memory. I want to thank the public for all their help and assistance with this investigation so far. We've already received numerous calls and I would encourage anyone with new information to call us. Three more unconfirmed sightings later came out of a young woman matching her description by Furston Lake between 9.30 and 11.15 a.m. Each witness described the same distraught female, dressed in dark clothes, crying on her cell phone. The only problem is her phone was shut off at 8.34 a.m. So how could this possibly be her? Her family became increasingly worried and made a public plea for her return. Police also wasted no time searching for Aston Lake, but again, came up with nothing. 33 days after she was missing, Leah's family made a second public plea for her return or any information regarding her whereabouts. We are the proud parents of Leah Croucher. Leah has been missing now for 33 long and agonizing days. Despite the extensive efforts of the police searches, despite over 120 of our family and friends who have handed out leaflets over three weekends as far afield as London and Birmingham, there have been no further confirmed sightings of Leah. Despite extensive police appeals, our previous press conference, shares and retreats on social media from family, friends, complete strangers and celebrities alike, Despite over 200 of you, the public, calling in, there have been no confirmed sightings of Leah. Her posters are on buses, trains, taxis and at various locations around the country. There is even a poster in the main train station in Berlin. Australia knows my daughter is missing, but still no further confirmed sightings of Leah. She has just literally vanished. We believe that somebody in Milton Keynes knows where Leah is. We need that person to call 101 and tell the police where to find her. We have received so much support from the public already, including the MK Dons at their home games and Asda printing her poster in large to display in their store. From the people who spent the days in the cold and the rain handing out leaflets to generate some of the 200 calls received by the police so far, and we are so grateful to every single one of you. So many of you have already gone above and beyond to offer us help in one way or another. And now one kind angel has offered a £5,000 reward for information leading to finding Leah. And we are beyond grateful for this extraordinary generosity. 
there will be large banners appearing at strategic locations across Milton Keynes this weekend, which will be advertising the £5,000 reward. More of the smaller posters will be appearing on more housing estates this weekend, thanks to our army of helpers. We are not going to stop. Please, I am speaking to that person or the persons out there who will start the trail to find our beautiful Leah. There is now a £5,000 reward. Pick up the phone and do the right thing. Call 101. Tell us how and where to find our daughter, please. We need to know that she is safe. Please call 101. Leah, if you were watching this, please come home. We miss you so much. If someone or something has upset you, we could help you to sort it out together as a family. Please come back to us. Your dad and I are worried sick about you. Everybody is. We want you here safe with us. We just want to give you a big cuddle. Please come home. We love you. Without any new leads in Leah's case, it's heartbreaking to watch these interviews because I can see the pain on each family member's face. The only one who never did interviews was her brother, Hayden. Leah and Hayden were very close and it was quite evident that he was just taking her disappearance very hard. The police department slowly released information as they got more leads. About four months after her disappearance, they released copies of the clothing that she was last seen wearing in the CCTV footage a gray hooded jumper with the Stuart by Taekwondo colorful logo on the front, as well as her dark skinny jeans, black high top converse, a black jacket, and a small black shoulder bag. Her sister Jade came out in July to plead to the public for her return and explained through tears what a nightmare this has all been. Leah Croucher is a loving sister and daughter who loves spending time at home. But this CCTV from the morning of the 15th of February shows the 19-year-old not far from the family home walking to work, but she never made it there. Today, her sister Jade says as the days turn into months since her little sister's disappearance, it's hard to stay hopeful. No words could really describe how hard it is. I think the worry that you feel is just immeasurable. You can't compare it to anything else that you've been through in life. Because in life, you do suffer losses or heartache or sadness. This is different to all of that. You don't have any answers. Leah's disappearance sparked an extensive police operation, which included a search of Teardrop Lake after reports of sightings of Leah there. Police also released these images of clothing, similar to the one she was wearing, in the hope it jogs someone's memory. But for Leah's family who've been waiting for news, another appeal for help in finding her. To anyone that might have information on Leah, I would beg them, please come forward. My family are living a nightmare, and that's the only way we can describe it. And I would hope that people would find it in their heart that if they did have that information, to help to end this nightmare. If Leah's listening to this, I just want her to know how loved she is. She's loved beyond measure. She's missed so much and there is nothing more that we want right now than for Leah to come home. Police say the investigation into Leah Croucher's disappearance is still ongoing. For her family, the focus is on remaining positive in the hope Leah is found. In October of 2019, a tip came into police that a man who had taken a walk around the Blue Lagoon in Betchley had seen that same Taekwondo hooded jumper with the colorful label hanging from a tree in February around the time of her disappearance. This location is about 2.8 miles from her last confirmed sighting on the CCTV footage from Buzzcott Lane. So police were quick to follow up on this lead. However, by the time the lake was searched, they came up empty handed. When we go back in the timeline on Valentine's Day, the day before Leah went missing, she left her house around 6 p.m., remember, to visit friends and didn't return home until 7.15 p.m. Well, as it turns out, Leah was meeting a special friend named Adnan Chowdhury. I hope I'm saying that right. Now, I can't find any verified pictures of Adnan, but he was much older, a 27-year-old man who was very strong in his Muslim faith. Not to mention, he was married. Apparently, Leah had kept this guy secret from her family for a while. Well, that is, until Hayden found out about him in early February 2019. 
Needless to say, Hayden wasn't very happy with this older married man. As Leah's big, protective older brother, Hayden began threatening this man, actually. And after Leah's disappearance, it became much worse. Hayden had become convinced Adnan was responsible for whatever happened to Leah, and he made his thoughts very clear, especially after Hayden found out through investigators that Leah had met up with him for a short period of time the night before she was reported missing. Of course, police spoke with Adnan early on in this investigation because Adnan had been apparently very forthcoming with police, and they were able to verify his story and alibi of the day of Leah's disappearance. However, that didn't sway Hayden's opinion, who had begun to start threatening and harass this older man online even more than before. Adnan eventually actually took Hayden to court, and he was told by a judge to stop taking the law into his own hands by threatening him after Leah disappeared. Hayden was accused of making threats to this 27-year-old married Muslim man who Hayden believed had groomed his sister and taken advantage of her. The judge gave 24-year-old Hayden a restraining order, which banned him from coming within 25 meters of Adnan. Judge Sheraton told Hayden, This is a real tragedy. You and your family are entitled and deserving of utter sympathy from everyone because Leah has gone missing. I can't get into the details of the police investigation, but I can tell you it's being controlled at a very high level. It is detailed, and if I respectfully say so, they are trying desperately hard. So you must allow them, however strongly you feel, to do their investigating. You will jeopardize the investigation if you get into your head that somebody is responsible for it. The police have fully investigated the person you suspected. There is at this stage nothing to support those suspicions, so can I plead with you to behave so that the police can complete this investigation? I would love to say with a happy ending, but I simply don't know. She is missing. So because the judge sympathized with Hayden, he basically got a slap on the wrist. Meanwhile, Hayden's mental health was seriously declining. Every new lead that came up came up empty-handed. He kept getting more and more depressed. And honestly, I can't blame him. This would be hard for anyone. The whole family was suffering, but Hayden had a long history of depression. If you remember in the Facebook banter between he and him and Leah, she referred to him as Sado. So I can't help but wonder if this was a reference for his long-standing mental health issues. Jade, the oldest sister, did everything she could to try to help her brother get through this hard time. The two oldest siblings shared their mother, Tracy Furness. In November, Hayden's mental health had declined so badly, though, that he told his therapist over three separate occasions that he was thinking of ending his life. He said that if he had the means to, he would do it. His therapist encouraged him to get inpatient treatment, which he willingly obliged to, although after only a few days in the hospital's care, they told him that they didn't have enough beds available and that he could go home to his mother's house under supervision. Two days later, and one day before Leah's nine-month anniversary of her disappearance, Tracy and Jade came home to find Hayden's feet dangling above the floor. The two women managed to get him down and do CPR, and they successfully got a pulse and some air, but unfortunately, he was brain dead due to lack of oxygen. He stayed in ICU for two days before John Croucher met with his ex-wife Tracy to hold their 24-year-old son's hand one last time before they said goodbye. It was everybody's final hope that if for some reason Leah left on her own accord, she would never miss her brother Hayden's funeral. But when Leah didn't show up, I think only part of the grieving process began for her. With the loss of Hayden looming over them, they were already grieving him, but they still needed a beacon of hope that Leah would be found, whether it's dead or alive. They needed something to fight for, and that's just what his beautiful family did. A lot of this story is about Hayden and Leah, but the underdog here is Jade, by far. She was the rock that the family needed. She was just as broken as everybody else, but she still fought to bring her sister home and hold everybody together. She had two mothers to console and a father. She handled herself beautifully and spoke so highly of her siblings, especially Leah. This poor family, I just can't imagine the anguish and torment of losing their sister, the daughter, and having no idea where she is or what happened to her, then to lose their son and brother all within nine months of each other. It's just unimaginable. Hayden couldn't handle his mental health after Leah's disappearance because he felt so alone and couldn't handle her passing. Other family members did their best to let him know that they were struggling too. John Croucher said, When they cleared the lagoon, I talked to him about how hard it was that they still have found nothing. We made plans to be together when they announced it so that we could go through this nightmare together. 
and Tracy Furness fought for the negligence of her son and how he was so badly failed by these hospitals that she actually is continuing to fight to this day. The fact that they said they had no beds available anymore, but they knew what a risk he was. And so she's still fighting that. Still fresh from the pain of losing Hayden, the one-year anniversary of Leah's disappearance didn't wait for the family's grieving. While two family members down, the rest of the family fought for Leah, even though they still had far more questions than answers. Leah Croucher is described by her family as lovely, caring, and compassionate. But for the past year, they've been without her after she suddenly went missing. It's left her parents searching for answers and living an everyday nightmare. There are times I feel very angry and I want to break things. There are times I don't want to get out of bed. I don't want to face the world. I just want to know where she went and what happened to her because I don't believe she chose this. I don't believe she ran away. Leah was last seen on CCTV on the morning of February 15th last year. She was on her way to work in Milton Keynes, but never arrived. Her disappearance led to a large police operation. Dive teams searched lakes across the town, while officers visited 4,000 homes as they gathered information. And it's particularly distinctive because of the colourful logo um, on the left-hand side of the chest. Now police are joining forces with Leah's family for this new appeal, believing someone knows what happened, particularly given where and when she was last seen. It's Friday the 15th of February. It's the day after Valentine's Day. It's the last day before the schools break up for half term. That is a really busy area. Um, it's a residential area. There's lots of pedestrians, um, local schools and nursery. Um, there's lots of sort of vehicle um, traffic. Um, somebody must have seen Leah. Police have doubled their award for information to £10,000. Since Leah's disappearance, her parents have endured further heartache, making their ongoing ordeal all the more traumatic. I've lost my daughter. I can't find her. And I've lost my son, who's committed suicide. That has completely and utterly destroyed me and my entire family. So somebody must have seen her. There was a Maybe your loved one's acting strange around that time. Think about it. All right. Although you think you're protecting them, you're destroying my family. I've lost Leah. I've lost my stepson, Hayden. And it's about time that you gave us all some peace. Leah's family say their lives will only get harder until they get answers. They desperately hope this fresh appeal for information will provide them. There weren't any new leads for years until a member of the public came forward with a photo of somebody dressed in all black. The picture was taken that same day in February, 2019, around 10.50 a.m. On the third anniversary of Leah's disappearance, the police came out with a statement and released a grainy, enhanced photo of a figure dressed in all black in a grassy area right near Furtston Lake, next to where Leah was last seen. The pink route is the route we know she took, the blue route is where she possibly walked when something may have happened to her. And the red is where we know she didn't make it that day. On the same day she went missing and this photo was taken, there were three unconfirmed sightings of a woman in distress by Ferdston Lake from 9.30 a.m. to 11.15 a.m., remember. Now, based on this new photo, released eight months ago, it finally gave credence to those sightings. The police were desperate to find out who this woman was. Based on the following video, it sounds like police had reason to believe it wasn't her, but were desperate to mark the lead off their list. So we're taking the opportunity of the third anniversary of Leah Go Missing to um, release some new images that have recently come into the police's um, possession. They're images taken by um, a member of the public who was in the area of Thurston Lake um, around 10.50. Um, in fact, the photographs are timed at 10.51 um, on Friday the 15th of February 2019, the date that Leah went missing. In those images, in the distance, there is a, a figure um, in dark clothing, possibly black clothing. Um, the image isn't of great quality, um, and it's impossible to say at this time whether or not it is Leah. However, um, in previous appeals, we've asked for information around a, a female um, matching Leah's description that is seen by three witnesses in that area of Thurston Lake at around that time. These images do appear to support these witnesses' descriptions of a female matching that description, wearing that type of clothing, 
in that area of Thurston Lake at that time. And we're seeking to appeal now for information, firstly for that person to look at those images and come forward. Uh, despite our previous appeals, we've never been able to identify that person so far. But also within the images, there are some other members of the public walking around the lake, dog walkers, etc. Um, we'd ask you to look at those images. And if we haven't spoken to you already, we'd also ask you to come forward because clearly there may be information, things that you saw or heard whilst you're out on your walk that morning that may help. So these witnesses came uh, forward quite early on in the investigation. Um, and my assessment has always been from the descriptions, the locations, the timings that they give, is that they were describing the, the same person. And so we've never been able to identify that person, but these images are now the first um, supporting evidence that we have um, that the witnesses have seen somebody matching that description in that area at that time and hopefully will assist us in identifying that person. If this is Leah, then this would be um, the last confirmed sighting that we would have of Leah at this time. And this is approximately two and a half hours after um, the CCTV footage um, that's previously featured of where we see Leah in Buzzercott Lane, generally heading in the direction of Thurston Lake on what we believe to be her route to work. Leah would have arrived at work or should have arrived at work by about nine o'clock. So um, the, the, if it is Leah, and to say, I have to you know, stress here, it's not possible to say whether or not this person is Leah from the quality of the image. But if this is Leah, then this is approximately almost two hours after she should have arrived at work. And, and clearly there's a question as to why she's in that location at that time. It's helpful that people are talking about Leah's case. We, we want people to be talking about Leah. We want people to be talking about her disappearance. Um, but it is... It has led to a lot of speculation and rumour and gossip, much of it on social media at times. Um, a lot of that has been um, unfounded. Um, it's based on um, sort of limited information and, and is factually incorrect. Um, and what I would ask people to do is, is just think about what they are posting. Um, Leah's family do monitor. They are watching out on social media um, to see if there is information that comes to light that will help um, sort of find their daughter, um, their sister, their friend. Um, mm -hmm. So I would just ask people, if you have genuine information around what's happened to Leah, whether that's friends or associates of Leah, whether that's somebody who thinks you might have seen Leah um, sort of after quarter past eight on, on the 15th of February, please come forward and speak to police if you haven't. But if it is just speculation and rumour, something where you've got no basis to it, I would just ask you to consider whether it's something that needs to be being posted on social media and think about the impact it could have on Leah's family. It's incredibly unusual and it's one of the really sort of bewildering and, and frustrating aspects um, of, of this investigation. Uh, so the investigation is now three years old um, and yet we are essentially no further forward in terms of um, Leah's movements uh, beyond the sighting of her in Buzzercott Lane um, at 8.16. Um, as the senior investigating officer, um, I don't think myself or, or the investigation team, any of us, envisaged being in this situation sort of three years ago that we'd be speaking here now no further forward. Um, it's been one of the largest missing person investigations that Thames Valley uh, has ever managed. But the particularly unusual feature of it is, is that there is simply appears to be no trace of Leah. Uh, and in this day and age with, you know, financial, social media footprints, um, et cetera, CCTV, that, that is really unusual and, and, and yeah, is, is a particularly bewildering element of this investigation. The lack of information and the lack of knowledge of what's happened to Leah is actually what gives me and allows me to retain some, some hope. Um, we retain an open mind around what's happened to Leah. We have a number of theories um, around Leah as to whether Leah's acted of her own accord, whether she's gone off with somebody, whether somebody may be involved in her disappearance. Um, I must stress that, say, um, although theory, theories remain open to us, at this stage, there is no evidence or credible information to indicate that somebody else is involved in Leah's disappearance. But the nature of her disappearance means that we, we simply can't preclude it and, and we will retain an open mind um, and follow all reasonable lines of inquiry. Again, not much immediately came out after this released photo. They did eventually find the woman who was in this picture, but that still didn't answer what happened to Leah. I think that's what makes this case so frustrating. I also find it odd that Thames Valley are begging members of the public to come forward. Isn't that what they're supposed to do as police officers? You don't sit and wait for the witness to seek you out. Yet the entire case, they low-key brag about how they've used so many resources, so many dive teams, special agents, knocking on 4,000 plus doors, yet they still don't know who the people and potential witnesses are in the area. And I, again, I know it's easy to criticize from home at a computer, but why brag about wasting all of this money when you haven't even done the bare minimum? I don't know, maybe I'm being a little too hard on these guys, but I also know how this case ends. And let me tell you, it's beyond frustrating. 
They spent so much money on this case. They made a blinking billboard with Leah's face that was more realistic, too, to help jog people's memories. In the billboard, she's wearing the black Taekwondo hoodie with that colorful emblem, similar to the gray one she wore when she went missing. And it's awesome that they can even do this. But the girl's face has been all over Buckinghamshire, all the way to London and even other countries in the UK. But for some reason, they thought this billboard would do the trick three years later. I get it. I get it. They were desperate. But this sort of thing is helpful in the beginning of an investigation, not something you use in fear of the case going cold. So they must be a huge department because of how big their jurisdiction is and all of the resources that they have access to. So I'm sure her family was happy with the help at the time. Families and authorities are using a new tool to help look for missing persons, three-dimensional posters. The 3D images are designed to make the faces they depict more memorable, like in the case of Leah Croucher. The 19-year-old went missing in 2019 from her town in England. Her parents told the BBC, We're scanning faces just in case it's Leah. Constantly looking just to, for any clue. Um, I look at people and just think, are you the person that took Leah? Leah's face is part of a new campaign in England. It shows the teen moving and blinking. The hope is that these more detailed images may trigger someone's memory and make those who are missing seem more real. There's technology now that enables us to make those images much more clear, higher resolution. They give that sense of a real human being behind the story. These new, simpler, cleaner images are a break from traditional missing posters that some say bombard the viewer with too much information. There are a couple other changes as well. Missing is replaced with the words, help find, it's a call to action. And the posters have QR codes to allow for easier sharing on social media. It's one more thing families, like Leah's, hope will help bring their loved ones home. I think sometimes having access to the resources that this police department has might be what caused them not to find her. I think of other departments who don't have access to resources like this one does, and I wonder, would they have knocked on 4,000 doors and not looked into the owners who didn't answer? Don't get me wrong, I'm sure there's good and lazy police in every department. I'm by no means calling this police department lazy, not at all. I just think they were a little too quick to jump on their resources is all. Of course, like we said before, hindsight is 2020. But not doing the bare minimum and not doing everything you can do before bringing in these expensive extra resources is kind of just shoddy police work and a waste of money, especially when there are other families in smaller districts who would love to have access to divers, special agents, and quick lab work. I feel badly for our departments and families who don't have access to these expensive resources. I bet they wouldn't have knocked on 4,000 doors and not looked into the people who avoided them or missed them. But anyways, let's keep going. So eight months after the photo of the figure in black was released, the Croucher family finally got some news. They would finally get the answers that were lying so close to home this entire time. After three years, eight months, and three days, a tip was called into investigators, and it blew the case wide open. On Monday, October 10th, 2022, at about 6.30 p.m., the police department were contacted regarding a property on number two Locksbear Drive. The blue line in the image indicates the area where Leah went missing after she was seen on CCTV at 8.15 a.m. When the police arrived, a number of items of interest were located inside the residence. These items included a black bag, just like Leah's, and it was filled with her belongings. Her remains were also finally found inside the property next to her black bag. The police then changed the investigation status from a missing persons investigation to a homicide investigation. This location on Locksbear Drive is less than a mile from her home and one mile away from her work, and only a half a mile from her last confirmed sighting. Again, the pink indicates where we know she walked, the blue is where she went missing, and the red is where she didn't make it. During the press conference, it was said that during their initial search for Leah, including those 4,000 door knocks, this address on Number 2 Drive was visited twice with no response. And that's what I meant earlier, guys. What happens when you knock on all these doors, but people don't respond? And I'm sorry, but like what? So in the initial search, right after Leah went missing, you visited the home where Leah Croucher's body was later found, and you didn't notice the odd smell that was allegedly coming from this property. Also, the door was knocked on twice. Nobody answered, so you just moved on? Why? Because the murderer didn't jump out and say, oh, hey, here she is. So why the hell wasn't the owner of that property not contacted, especially if they visited it twice? 
If this was a proper investigation, investigators should have made a list of houses that didn't respond after the second contact and spend however many days it took getting in contact with the owners to find out who the owner is, where they were on the 15th during that time in which she was last seen, if they were on vacation, who had access to the property, all of it. That's what should have been done, especially since that house was on one of the same roads that Leah was suspected to have vanished from. Everything in this case would have been different had they just done the bare minimum. As if this isn't frustrating enough, just wait, it gets worse. They discover the owner of this property rarely ever stayed there because he lives overseas. The owner of the home who has not been named said he wasn't even in the UK at the time of the inquiries. Which, hold on, doesn't that indicate that he stayed there at some point after she was put there? It doesn't say either way, but I was really concerned when I heard that. Detectives investigating Leah's disappearance and now death finally announced that they had a suspect, a man by the name Neil Maxwell, who was the handyman for the owner's property. Neil had a key to the home to keep up maintenance at the time of Leah's disappearance. Neil wasn't maintaining much in the home, but his unfortunate sick fantasies. This is the last time Leah Croucher was seen walking to work in February 2019. More than three and a half years later, her parents say their darkest fears have come true after the missing person inquiry became a murder investigation and now another significant update. We have nominated a suspect in this case. His name is Neil Maxwell. Neil Maxwell was a 49-year-old registered offender in the area. He had multiple offenses against him over the years, including a warrant he had for sexually attacking a woman in November of 2018, just a few months before Leah went missing. Apparently, there were multiple attempts for his arrest, but he would change locations frequently and use burner phones as well as rented vehicles. You would think that somebody trying to rent a vehicle with a felony warrant would maybe flag on the rental company system, and I don't know if that isn't a thing by now. It for sure should be. Now, one of Neil Maxwell's old bosses, who wanted to stay anonymous, took him on as a mechanic for a few years before Neil was jailed for RAPE in 2009. He called the authorities on Neil after he was arrested. The business owner tried to warn police that he was dangerous. He said he grew concerned about his behavior and told them, quote, he's an evil effer. He can't control his sex urges and he's going to kill someone. I argued with police and I told them that one day he's going to wind up killing someone. His urges were getting worse and worse and worse. He RAPE'd a young girl and the police did nothing. They treated it like they were just issuing a parking ticket. When Neil's boss saw his probation report, he said they had him taking every course there was, but he was still labeled as a dangerous man. The anonymous boss's claims were substantiated by Neil's ex-girlfriend, who said that he groomed her and dated her while she was underage. She also indicated that he would force her to do things. She said at the time she didn't think it was wrong, but now she realizes that he had a sick obsession with underage girls. He was known around the area for trying to pin girls down and force himself on them, and she described his character as deeply sinister. Unfortunately, as I said, this case gets more and more frustrating as we go on. To make it even worse, even though we have a body now, there won't be justice in this case, because Neil Maxwell took his own life two months after Leah's disappearance. This just upsets me so much to find out because not only was this sweet, innocent girl who was well-trained in self-defense taken from her family, but her brother also took his life over the anguish of losing her and the answers that her family fought so hard to get now can't be answered. Who was seen at Teardrop Lake by Leah's work? How did he take her in the middle of this heavy commuted area of traffic? Was she killed quickly and painlessly? How long was she in that house alive? Just very disturbing and upsetting questions still that have to be left unanswered. Luckily, even though the police department spent a lot of their resources on Leah's disappearance, they're just as dedicated to finding out as much as they can about her murder. Welcome and thank you for coming to our press conference today regarding the disappearance of Leah Croucher and the subsequent murder investigation. I cannot even begin to imagine what it is like for Leah's parents and family for three years and eight months not knowing what has happened to their daughter and loved one. All of the investigation team who are working on this case are dedicated to finding the truth for Leah's family. I want to recap on the developments this week since Monday the 10th of October and provide a number of updates in relation to our investigation, which, as I'm sure you can appreciate, 
is complex and fast moving. On Monday, at about 6.30pm, police were contacted with information about a property in Locksbeer Drive, Thursden, Milton Keynes. We promptly attended and a number of items were located inside the property. These items included a rucksack and personal possessions belonging to Leah, who was reported missing on the 15th of February 2019. Sadly, human remains were also found inside the property close to the rucksack. As a result of our findings, Thames Valley Police changed its investigation from a missing person investigation to a murder investigation. As I stated, the investigation is moving at pace, and as such, I can share with you some further updates today. But at the very outset of our investigation into the disappearance of Leah, we assigned to this case our most experienced and capable team of detectives, led by a senior investigating officer. This attests to our determination to find Leah. Thereafter, we immediately and thoroughly followed every reasonable line of inquiry. We committed hundreds of officers and staff to the search for Leah, reviewing 1,200 hours of CCTV, conducting more than 4,000 house-to-house inquiries, searching lakes, open land and woodland. We have sustained and significant media appeals and offered several public rewards for information. But sadly, the call from the member of the public that we received on Monday this week was the first occasion that information was made available to enable the investigation team to provide any link between that address in Lockbeer Drive and Leah. Prior to this, in the course of visiting those 4,000 properties, I can confirm that number two Lockbeer Drive was visited on at least two occasions. However, there was no response at the house. Therefore, we dropped a leaflet through the letterbox requesting a callback if the occupants of the property had any information. In addition to the house-to-house -house inquiries, we also vis visited the property to scope what CCTV may be available in the area. Since we were alerted to this property on Monday evening, we have established that the property is owned by someone who lives overseas and rarely visits the United Kingdom. It is now known that the owner was not in the UK at the time Leah was reported missing and the house was unoccupied when police attended on these inquiries. Today, I am able to confirm that we have nominated a suspect in this case. His name is Neil Maxwell. However, Maxwell was found dead on the 20th of April 2019, having taken his own life. It is unusual to name a suspect, but we have also learned this week that during the time when Leah went missing, and whilst the owner of the property was not in the UK, Maxwell was the only person to have keys to that property. Maxwell had been employed by the homeowner to carry out some property maintenance at the house. We now know that Maxwell had keys to this property from November 2018. Whilst Maxwell has been nominated as a suspect, this does not mean he is guilty of any offence. We will keep an open mind and our detailed investigation will seek to gather sufficient evidence to establish the truth. This may or may not implicate or exonerate Maxwell or any other persons from the investigation. Maxwell has previous convictions for sexual offences against women and girls and was wanted in connection with a sexual assault in Newport Pagnell in November 2018. The sexual assault was reported to Bedfordshire Police on the 29th of November 2018 and the case was transferred to Thames Valley Police on the same day. We first attempted to arrest Maxwell in connection with the sexual assault the following day, the 30th of November 2018, at an address in central Milton Keynes, but Maxwell was not present. During this time, we established that Maxwell was at an unknown location in Scotland at one point, but further arrest attempts were continually made throughout the UK at various different addresses. 
Maxwell knew he was wanted in connection with the sexual assault and was travelling across the UK and making concerted efforts to evade arrest, including using false names and changing his mobile phone and vehicles. He is highly likely to have known that he would be returning to prison if he was arrested and convicted. Thames Valley Police shared Maxwell's name with other police forces on the Police National Computer in December 2018. We also published a wanted, public wanted appeal to find Maxwell on the 4th of April 2019, but Maxwell was subsequently found dead on the 20th of April 2019, having taken his own life. A significant number of inquiries were made nationally to locate Maxwell, and these included 18 separate arrest attempts. And in April 2019, when we published our wanted appeal regarding Maxwell in connection with the sexual assault in Newport Pagnell, and during our entire investigation to find Leah, there has been no direct link between Maxwell and Leah until this week, when we were called about the property in Locksbeer Drive. If Maxwell was alive today, we would be seeking his arrest in connection with this investigation, so he could be interviewed under caution to provide his account. As such, today I'm appealing to anybody who had contact with Maxwell between November 2018 and his death in April 2019, or anybody else who has informa information that might help our inquiry to contact Thames Valley Police. You can do this by, contact, by visiting our website or by calling 101, quoting Operation Innsbruck. That's Operation Innsbruck. The property in Locksbury Drive is a complex and challenging scene. And I want to let local residents know that it could be a number of weeks before we are able to conclude our forensic examinations. Therefore, we expect this investigation to be protracted, but we will update the public and the media as we have done when we can during our investigation. The outpouring of emotion and support to Leah's family from the community has been overwhelming. Leah's family continue to be supported by our specially trained officers and our thoughts are and always will be with them. Before I take questions, the senior investigation officer visited Leah's parents and family this morning and fully briefed them on everything I have just told you. They know of this press conference and they have specifically asked me to read the following. We would like to take this opportunity to thank Thames Valley Police for all their efforts over the last three years and eight months. We believe that they could not have done anything differently. They have always approached every conversation with dignity and compassion. As a family, we ask that everyone respects our privacy, as well as our immediate family, at what is one of the most difficult times of our lives. Visited the home number two on that drive and left a note with flowers in front of the house. The note read, to our darling Leah, our darkest fears have come true. We only need to be apart a little longer now. We have missed you for so long already. The future looks so bleak now that we know we'll, that we will never see your smile or hear your laugh again. We will cherish your memories forever. We love you, mom and dad. Which I am just so glad that they can finally put their daughter to rest. Yes, we still have questions and who knows how many of them can be answered after this investigation. This case really just makes you wonder, how many times have you been so close to never seeing your family or friends again and never even knowing it? For Leah, even though she was an expert at Taekwondo, she was only 5'2", so she wouldn't stand a chance if a 6'2", 200-pound man ran up behind her when she wasn't paying attention. Again, it's so easy to criticize the victims or question things, but just remember, unless you're in that same situation yourself, you don't know what you would do and how you would react. So it's okay to learn from others. I think we should all try to take something away from each case that you hear. This one's a tough one, and I'm not sure what Leah could have done differently. She switched up her routes to work often enough, but it just so happens that this guy was watching her and took away something so beautiful that we don't get back. 
And this is why I say that her case is unique in many ways. I really do hope that her family gets all of their questions answered when the investigation is over. And I want to know what your thoughts are. How do you think the police department conducted themselves? If only they had put more effort into arresting Neil, maybe two beautiful people would still be alive. And again, I know I'm being tough on this police department, but it just really bothers me. The Croucher family is definitely more gracious than I am, that's for sure. But at the same time, they must be so sick and tired and just happy to lay their daughter to rest finally. In a public statement they made, they said they don't blame the police and that they did everything that they could. I'm hoping in the near future that we'll have updates and learn more about the timeline. I mean, I think it's just the least that can be done for Leah. So I'm curious to know your thoughts, guys, on this case. Do you think that he had been watching her a long time? Was this just a crime of opportunity? Why didn't they follow up with the owner of this house sooner or more diligently, I should say? I mean, how does this something like this get prevented? Because now not only is Leah gone, but her brother is gone as well. So at least they're together and reunited in, you know, whatever spirit form you believe in. Thanks again for taking the time to tune in today, guys. And until the next one, stay safe. Bye.